Well, good morning, young people, Colonial Christian School. Pastor Bill speaking. I have with me today uh, Brother Zach Viola. And we're going to do something different. Normally, we have the preaching of the word and a sermon. It's all part of uh, what we describe as chapel. But I, I thought maybe you'd, you'd be interested in missions. Every once in a while, we'll have a missionary here at South Bay Baptist Church, and we give them the opportunity to speak to the uh, student body, which you've heard Brother Zach speak to us uh, outside a couple weeks ago, and he's, he's back with us again. But this time, rather than Zach giving us a sermon, we're going to talk about uh, missionaries, missions in the church. Some of you may go to a church where you have a missions program and you know that there are uh, families that are in other countries and uh, they are preaching the gospel, telling other nations and other languages about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then some of you may not uh, have at, at all familiar with uh, how missionaries are called in the service or where they go and what is their life like. So we have a couple of questions here that uh, what I will do is ask uh, Brother Zach the questions and, and then he's going to give answers from his experience, from what he's known from other people that are in missionary work and uh, try and educate you guys on, uh, on the, uh, the ministry of missionary work in the Bible-believing churches. So we'll begin with a word of prayer and then proceed from there. So let's pray together. Father, we do thank you that uh, there is what is known as the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and to preach the gospel. And uh, Brother Zach is here as a representative of that. You've called him to that ministry. But we want our young people to understand uh, how God calls people like that and what kind of work do they do and what are the different peoples and the, the kind of things that they experience. We live in a very comfortable nation. Some nations and countries are different. But yet, the, the gospel was meant to go worldwide. So might this be a time of learning? And at the same time, maybe, Lord, you will speak to somebody's heart and give an interest, plant that, uh, that spark and that desire to want to be able to serve you in, a, in this very special way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Zach, good morning. And here we are at, uh, in our chapel service. So the... I'm, I'm going to try and ask these questions as if I were in an elementary classroom or a middle school, anywhere in a school setting, and um, maybe like a missionary, I never heard of such a creature, what is that? So that'll be the first question. What is a missionary? Maybe you could elaborate on that for the benefit of the student body. Well, one of the factors is is that a missionary, all too often when you hear that word, people have this grand idea of this superhero or this like guy who's so tight, who's had so close in a relationship with Jesus Christ that he's got answers from God every single day. Mm -hmm. But in reality, a missionary is just somebody who's just following the will of God for his life. Plain and simple, it's just the everyday Christian but who has submitted his life to serve God for the rest of his life. So it starts out to be a missionary, or what a missionary is, is an individual that has already surrendered his life to whatever the Lord wants him to do. Exactly. Before we got into this uh, interview, we used the term of the, the, the call and then the direction. Can you expand on that? Well, in uh, a lot of times in the old days, they, a pastor would say you have to be called to be a missionary. Well, in reality, the call, God calls people to serve him in the ministry. Okay. And then there's different avenues of the ministry, of the ministry. For example, there's youth pastors, there's pastors, there's our, uh, reformer unanimous uh, leaders, pastors, mm -hmm. there's yeah. associate pastors children's pastors and so there's all these different avenues in the ministry so the call and you and you you always hear a call to be a missionary but you never hear a call to be a youth pastor or a call to be an associate pastor right right and so it's it's the call to be in the ministry god calls okay. you to be in a ministry and then he he places on your heart this burden for a certain area of the ministry ah. And so missions is one of those avenues and so god calls and then he directs you where he wants you to be so this, we're using a word here, and uh, as, as Christians, and we have uh, church speak, ministry speak. In fact, that is the word itself. 
is the word ministry. Uh, that actually has a, a meaning of its own. Can you expand on that a little bit? What is it to be the minister and ministry? Well, to be in the, in the ministry is simply you're, 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 you, you've surrendered your life to God to be in the ministry. Mm -hmm. And the ministry is then that you're fully committed your life to sharing the gospel, fully committed your life to discipling, fully committed your life to helping Christians grow to be stronger as well as getting the gospel work out wherever you can. So now as a pastor, the, the word there, the minister, comes from the same word that's used as a servant, one that exactly. serves tables, a slave, etc. So if we take that, and what you're saying is then uh, 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 an individual that enters into the call of the ministry is a call to be a servant, a dedicated servant to the Lord, and going back into the New Testament times, servants did not choose the occupation. They didn't choose the direction. Now, I don't want to be a field laborer today. I'd rather be working, uh, uh, you know, setting tables for the master. That servant was at the disposal of the master. Mm -hmm. exactly. And uh, so if I hear you correctly, then to enter into ministry is to say, I'm entering into to be a servant of the Lord wherever he wants to use me, admissions is a particular calling like anything else, but in this case we're talking about missionaries, so being directed into missions is the way that God would then follow through with that servant's heart. Exactly. Uh, interesting, interesting. So let me ask you another question then, let's, let's still on the, the missionary, what, what does a missionary do? So he's in another country, so give us some idea of his day-by-day -day activities. Well, if a missionary just got on to the field, usually uh, there's a lot of prep work before a missionary even enters into the field that's behind the scenes. Because um, you gotta, you got to have a place lined up for you to sleep. you got to have a place lined up for you. you got to figure out where all the stores are, where you, where you can get stuff from. And so day-to-day uh, -day missionary life in the very beginning can be really busy because you're just trying to get everything started and going and placed in getting everything in place but usually on a typical day-to-day -day missionaries work they're usually out sharing the gospel finding people they can share the gospel with uh, going to businesses going into the grocery stores building those relationships with people because okay. most of the time a lot of uh, sometimes a missionary will go to a place where there's a lot of tourists sometimes mm -hmm. and so there is uh, when you just have these everyday passing Americans coming in and out and maybe you don't like, oh no, I'm not one of those. I'm, I'm, I'm here to live with you. I'm here yeah. to be with you. And, um, and so every day to day, going out in the gospel, uh, meeting with people, setting up uh, just trying to find ways to meet people and build relationships with people to get the gospel to them so they can have a chance to accept or right. reject. Now, when you, when you talk like that, you talk about there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of people, and commercial life, citizen life, etc. Is it easy to get sidetracked? In other words, develop a mentality, I'm here, uh, uh, kind of like from a job perspective, and lose the, the heart of the missionary's work. Is, can that be a temptation or a distraction with all that extra stuff that goes on? It can be. Um, I've heard plenty of situations before. Uh, I've heard of one situation before where a missionary went to a country and he had all his support raised up from churches and he was always sending letters back to the churches saying, I got people getting saved, people getting baptized, uh, people, I'm discipling people. And then when a church finally went down there to go visit him, it turned out all that was a lie. Oh my. And so it it's, it's truly is a factor that a missionary can lose perspective on why he is there. Okay. Make a note here because uh, there are two things that you brought up. One is uh, when it comes to being a, you're, you're there to present Jesus Christ. We're right. talking about the gospel, the good news. So the uh, the way I was brought up, uh, the missionary was a kind of guy you envisioned him in the jungle, uh, working with uh, people that had no knowledge at all of, of God or anything else, and, and you're trying to present to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then as time comes by, technology comes in, I'm, I'm finding out that there are 
other ways in which you can still be a missionary, but there are different avenues of input of entering into that society. Can you give me some some examples of what that might be like? Well, uh, if I can jump back in in your earlier statement here real fast, like back in back in the old 50, 60, 100 years ago, you had that facet of where missionaries were going to places where there was no internet connection. There was no pop, like no ways to email and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they were in the jungle, no running water, no things like that. Uh, today, that's not so much the case. I mean, you have modern countries now, modern cities. If I can give a quick example on that real fast, you have Japan, mm -hmm. which is a modern country. And then I was, I have a missionary friend who's going, trying to get there. And Japan, less than point zero, less than point five percent of the country even claims to have any association with Christianity at all, and that doesn't even include the Baptists or wow. the true faith. And so, but when it comes to avenues with some of these uh, more modern day cities, uh, like capitals or uh, the cities, when you think of. It, it, there's still areas all around the world that are still jungle, no internet connection, things like that. But most of the time, missionaries are in a, base themselves in a city, and they'll go out from that city into those jungle areas. Okay. And so, a, but when a missionary is focused on, for example, a city like Tokyo or Hong Kong or even London, um, uh, or a, a foreign country that doesn't speak English, one of the avenues that they use, because a lot of times, when you're going to a completely different country, it's usually ruled by another religion mm -hmm. and so people are like oh I want nothing to do with you and so one of the things that I know a lot of missionaries do over in China mostly because of government restrictions and things like that they'll start English classes in their house and they'll infuse and have the gospel be a part of every single English teaching uh, lesson to be able to share the gospel in every single lesson while also teaching English to them because that English is a way yeah. to get into their households you know, I've heard, and actually I spoke with different missionaries that have come to our church, that sometimes the only way that you can get in country is if you have a trade skill, for example, medicine or English, science or something like that. You have a skill that you can bring to that country, and then uh, that becomes, as far as the country is mm -hmm. concerned, your occupation. But at the same time, you're very upfront and using that medical area as teaching and preaching opportunities also. Exactly. Um, for example, down in Panama, two of the even though Panama has freedom of religion in their constitution, the two best ways we have found in Central America to get the gospel in the houses is either through a sports ministry or through a medical ministry. Um, because uh, in Central America, it's dominated by Catholics. And even though they may not go to the Catholic Church, they say, oh, well, I'm Catholic because my family's Catholic. And so... It's just that avenue of, well, we're here, we're providing a need that they have physically, but at the same time providing, showing them they have a spiritual need. So how would that work in real life? At practice, they uh, would have a devotional time or a Bible study time or something that was incorporated, and maybe for that team it would be mandatory. For example, um, one of the things we do, that can be done that we've done at my home church is at, at kids come to practice or come to the game and either after every, every single practice I mean, even sometimes after every single game we'll do a devotion that takes them from how God created the world from creation to Christ uh, okay great throughout the great. season now um, let's suppose in your situation you're going to be you're you are on what we call deputation. Is that the, the, the term that's that, that is a term that is still All used. Right. So describe that, and then we'll take it to the next level. Well, which aspect? <laughs> well, uh, we're, we're dealing with you need support. That's one of the things I, we understand with missionaries. If, if where you are going is not a paid job while you're there as a doctor or a teacher, then you come in as supporting yourself. Well, if you had a job in America and you want to go be a missionary, you still need money. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about raising uh, the, the monies, the funds necessary to keep you and your family there year after year after year? So the way it works is uh, if you want to 
go into the mission field, one of the things is you need a home church, of course, that's going to be sending you out, your, which is your your first supporting church. They're the ones mm -hmm. who gives you the, the funds to kickstart your deputation. And then you also have an agency that helps you deal with everything on the government's side of things as well. Um, one of the things that many people don't realize is, is that missionaries are looked at as businesses. So I'm not, All right. just, so I'm not just paying regular taxes, I'm paying business taxes. Yeah, okay. And so um, one of those things that help, uh, so when you get all started and you get those funds to get started from your home church, um, you start, you just talk to your pastor, figure out, get name, names of other pastors that he knows of churches that you can possibly go to. Mm -hmm. And then you, you talk to other missionaries you possibly know to get pa uh, get pastor, pastor names of churches that they've been in. And you start building this, try to build this list that you can send your information to and then make phone calls and try to get appointments and to go and present your ministry to that church. And then once you have presented in a church, the, uh, the church will decide, depending on how they're set up to do it. Every church does it a little bit differently. Um, some churches will go right then and there on you. Mm -hmm. Other churches will wait until their business meeting to take a vote. And so um, once you present it, the church decides whether or not they will come alongside you and to give you funds to okay. send you to the mission field. So in your situation, because you'll be our, our model case right now, how much will it cost you annually uh, to be able to live in Panama and um, live there comfortably, still do the missionary work? So what would you, what number would you say, this is what we need before we can actually leave the United States? Well, we really don't base it off annually. We base it off monthly of what okay. we need. And for us, for me and my wife, we're looking around $4,500. A lot of that is, that includes like health insurance, that includes life insurance, that includes uh, taxes that we have to pay to the U.S. government, that pays for language school, that pays for a vehicle that we have to get when we get down there. Otherwise, we gotta wait two hours for the bus to show up yeah. to take us anywhere. Um, that includes like food, uh, rent for housing, and so, that's what we're looking at personally. So you have your personal funds, which are all taxable. Okay. And then you have your ministry funds that you raise, which don't get taxed. And we're looking to raise about 3000 a month for the ministry fund. So that includes things like renting a building for, uh, for meetings, renting uh, for discipleships, uh, future church buildings, the training materials for pastors, the purchasing of Bibles, the purchasing of uh, music equipment, and all, everything that goes into it. That could be pretty expensive. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so we're up to $7,500 a month is, is what is necessary. Right. Uh, uh, to make it like simple math, you would need 75 churches. On, on average, a church, an, the average church gives about 100 a month. Okay. So you would need at least 75 exactly. churches at $100 a month. Yes, sir. And those churches that would be committed to... Uh, sending that much support to you each month or to your representative agency like uh, for us it would be Bible Baptist Fellowship mm -hmm. um, they BBFI the missionary division of it and then they would make sure that you receive that money it is, it, the agencies would work like the BBFI Central Missionary Clearing House uh, Vision Baptist Missions they work each one works a little bit differently but pretty much they're there to make sure that you don't get in trouble with the government when it comes to your funds. Okay. Now, now that we're talking about money, you're on the mission field. A missionary is there and he's doing his work. How do we know in the United States? So we have 75 churches and Zach Viola and his wife are in Panama and they're doing their work. Uh, how do we know that you are actually doing that work? How do you guys have a, a system of accountability? Which is biblical, mm -hmm. you know. Yes, how, 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 what, what, how does that uh, transpire? Well, back in the day, that was a lot whole, harder when there was no modern technology for missionaries to be kept accountable. Uh, but with today, with modern technology, we have social media platforms that we can we have set up. We have set up um, to where I have a website, I have a Facebook account. Um, my wife has an Instagram, mm. and we church churches and people in churches can follow us and we can put up daily uh, daily or weekly things showing them what we're doing wow. on the field that is and a lot then, different 
Uh, but normally the traditional way of reporting is to usually write a monthly or bi-monthly or even a quarterly letter to each church telling them what you are doing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but as I mentioned earlier, there was a missionary who was doing that, but then he, everything in the letter wasn't yeah. true. Yeah. So real uh, time pictures make a difference. Exactly. Real time pictures, videos of showing what you're doing. And then the other facet of the side is churches who support you coming down on a missions trip and helping you out yeah and actually seeing and being a part of the work very interesting you know i i'm much older than what probably old enough to be your dad but it, i remember in the day where um missionaries would speak to family members by way of ham radio <laughs> high the high frequency antenna <laughs> And uh, to this day in our church, I can remember uh, a fella had a, a radio, a shortwave radio is what it was. And it would squeal and hiss, and they turned it down to one particular frequency. Now, if we're here in the United States and they're on the other side of the world, uh, that radio signal, uh, first off, you had to make sure you're on at the same time. <laughs> 8 p.m. at night here could be uh, 8 a.m. of the next morning over there. But at any rate, uh, you could just hear those. And then they would be able to speak and talk back and forth. That was the form of communication. Pretty much the only way. The letters were, that was called snail mail. Exactly. And Still is. <laughs> shortwave radio was a real breakthrough uh, during that period of time. So for those uh, students, you know, that's, that was before uh, the time with your two thumbs, you could write a letter to mama and let her know what's going down while you're in Australia. This was a day you chose the time. Uh, you did all that ahead of schedule with letters. Okay, at a point of date, point in time, we'll give you on such and such a frequency. And if the <laughs> weather was good, you had a good communication. And that just shows you the difficulty of how uh, if missionaries need to get, reach their churches or churches need to reach the yeah. missionary uh, back in the day. And now all you need is this one little app and send a text and you're good to go. <laughs> Well, now let's let's talk about uh, here we are on the 21st century. Um, when you let's say, for example, you're going to be in Panama and, and you're there for 20 years, maybe 30 years, and you raise a family and and the, the Lord says, "All right, Zach and, and wife and kids, I want you to go to another country," or you're, you're ready to retire, whatever it might be. What happens to that church? Will they just dissolve because you left, or is there something that you're going to do right up front to make sure that church always exists? Well, that is one of the big things. Unfortunately, back in the day uh, when America was sending out these huge number of missionaries and everything, um, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of them came back and they were the pastor of churches in those countries for 20, 30 years, and they came back to America saying, I need somebody here to replace me as the pastor there. Mm. And I, I, I just remember reading accounts on that and hearing many people who are higher up in the, uh, in the, in the agencies now today tell me about those situations. And so it should never, never be the goal of a missionary to be really be a pastor long term on the foreign field. Mm -hmm. The goal of a missionary is to train people who God calls into the ministry to be pastors and mm. then plant churches with those people as a pastor from day one. I think they're called indigenous. Indigenous, yes. yes. There's a new word for the, the students. And what a simple definition for an indigenous pastor. An indigenous pastor is a, simply the person who was born in that country. All right. Saved in that church. Saved in that church, baptized in that church. And probably, um, if they're going to need a Bible education, I know many missionaries actually establish schools. Yes. Um, whether it be a uh, kindergarten on up school, or a lot of times they establish like Bible institutes and a Bible college. Usually what happens is um, when a missionary first starts out and you need to get people trained, I've heard some missionaries partnering with Bible colleges here in the United States and that college will send them materials that the person can work through to get mm -hmm. college credit and everything. Other 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 missionaries will set up their own seminary in their country because that just isn't possible where they're at. And they'll still get their hands on the material but then translate it all into that language. Uh -huh. And then have their own permanent seminary there. And a seminary is just a fancy word for uh, a Bible school. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so... 
uh, they'll teach those God God has called into the ministry at that Bible college, and uh, there, and then take those gentlemen and uh, prepare them uh, over the years. Uh, normally, uh, it can be depending on what a missionary does, anywhere from a year to five years, depending on how long they want the training to be, <laughs> and then go from there with taking that person and then telling him, okay, I'm going to help you start a church over here. Okay. So, so now your church becomes a church that plants other churches in that same country. Exactly. Exactly. The goal is uh, for, is to start a church. Uh, there's many different models of doing it. One model is called the mother church, uh, mm -hmm. which we're talking about here, the mother, mother church aspect. You plant one church, and then from that one church, you start training people who God calls from that church and then take them and plant other churches from out among that church. Wow. There's other missionaries who plant their church, leave, leave it in the hands of the indigenous pastor, the native pastor, and then they'll go to a completely different town by themselves and start the okay. process all over again. Yeah. So there's different ways in which you can do it. The idea is to continue to reproduce ourselves exactly. as, as either as believers or as churches in those countries. Yes. And we have a missionary that was just with us a couple uh, weeks ago Oliver Williams been down there for 50 years in Peru and their ministry is very interesting they've established went that back there 50 years ago they established one church going door to door established a church then they established a Bible Institute and and then they begin to establish additional churches and missions from that country and those missions are building churches and reproducing again so exactly it is a very biblical concept, and this is what Jesus meant in Matthew when he said to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Yep. Bap teaching and baptizing, and what you're doing is describing that. Well, one other question I think uh, would be that of language. So if, if I'm going to go to Japan or even down to Panama and I'm going to become a missionary in that country, how do I learn that language? Do I learn it while I'm there? Can we go to school? What is, what's a good answer for There's that? There's many options on how you can do this. There, for a lot of people, they'll start the language process here in the United States while they're traveling around visiting churches. Um, that's usually the more difficult route because when you're learning a language on your own and you don't have no native speakers around you, it's really difficult mm. to, to learn it because you're not using it every day. So, uh, for example, my plan is um, my wife is from Costa Rica. She speaks Spanish. Uh, we're going to a Spanish-speaking country. So my wife is going to be helping me learn the language while at the same time I'm taking classes in Panama while working among the Panamanian people every single day. And I'm, that will help me learn the language even faster. So you're going to, like, rather than learning the language stateside, you'll go down and learn it while you're there. Exactly. On the job training. On the job training, and because when that happens, you got Spanish people all around you all the time. Mm -hmm. Nobody's speaking English to you, so you got to learn the language if you want to get food from the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to come pretty quick. <laughs> or get a taxi in the right direction. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sure that could be a problem if we're not careful. Well, let's just talk about your ministry here for a, a little bit. Um, how long have you been on deputation and, and since God? put you in the direction of missions. Well, I technically started, this has been a weird year with COVID and everything. Technically, we got all our paperwork done to be recognized as missionaries in January of 2020. But because of COVID, we didn't, we did not start traveling until August of 2020. Wow, so, <laughs> so we've only been on the road for about seven months now. Mm -hmm. And so, and uh, with COVID, it's just even more difficult support yeah, right <laughs> so you're looking for 7500 a month and you by the way I we said okay 75 churches a hundred dollars a month that seems like an easy number but how <laughs> many churches would you actually have to visit uh, just to and again this is up between them and the Lord whether they believe that uh, they want to support you or not so about how many would you have to visit so uh, on before COVID, the average time it took a missionary to get all of his support rings, the average time for a missionary family to get all the money they need, 
took about three and a half years. Or that's the average oh, time. Yeah. The quickest I, I've ever heard of anybody raising their funds was six months. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but So right now, uh, to give an example, I have uh, worked through about eight states so far. And those eight states add up to about um, around 4,000 phone calls. Whoa. Out of those 4,000 phone calls, we've gotten about 100 bookings out of those. And so we've only done a portion of those visits so far. Uh, we've been to about, I want to say, 30, 35 churches so far. And about, uh, about one out of every three or four have been taking us on for support. Mm-hmm. And that could so, be at any number. And that can be at any number. $10 to 100 yeah. Exactly. So that's uh, that tells me in closing it would tell me this you have to you have to be certain and sure that this is the direction that God wants you to go in. Absolutely. And, and for example, uh, there's uh, some mission <laughs> just making the phone calls every single day. Yeah. Uh, you had in this not getting answers, uh, nobody answering the phones or pastors. Usually out of every 10 to 20, between 10 and 20 calls, I get, I'll get i get at least maybe one or two bookings. Wow. So you're looking at a 10% <laughs> booking rate. Yeah, really. <laughs> really. And you know, uh, I, I think I heard you say earlier that individuals from that local church mm-hmm. uh, can also support, whether it's through the church or not. A lot of the times what happens is there's some churches that are just so full of missionaries already, they don't have it in their budgets to take on anymore, or the church is a new church, and they don't have that many people to really have a real missions program yet. But what I have uh, come across, I, I went to one church in Ohio, and the church was a new church plant, wasn't able to take me on for support at the time, but one of the members of the congregation decided that they wanted to support me privately uh, and so that's what and so that's what they have been doing for the past mm-hmm. six months even though the church hasn't taken me on as their official missionary yeah. well God being as generous as he can people have the liberty to be able to uh, answer that even a call in their own heart to support in your case uh, a work that's down there and there could be a, a variety of reasons we just don't you know God's ways are mysterious and for sure it'd be a blessing to you. Well, I, just in closing, I want to say this, that a missionary is just simply a Christian who is following the will of God. Mm. So. And in this case, to be very committed, because it could be discouraging to I be out for three sir. years, and uh, you know, you're know you not quite there yet. And you can't jump the gun on this. You're it's, down there and have no place to live. You truly have to be, I've heard missionaries before going, and they've only had 80% of their support. Mm-hmm. And it just turns out absolutely horrible yeah, when disaster. they got to their field. Yeah. Well, we are talking, now we're talking about living by faith. <laughs> yes, sir. And that's what it all boils down to. Well, let's close with prayer. Well, students, I hope uh, this little interview just give you a little bit of insight on uh, the life of a missionary, how missions are started in the church, why God wants us to do that. And, you know, uh, when you get down to it, any one of you, can be a part of a missions program either by prayer or just financial support and it doesn't mean you have to have a hundred dollars or even ten dollars you can make a contribution to of whatever number god lays upon your heart and you can know for sure that you were part of making sure other people in other countries are able to receive the gospel message for their for eternal life for their soul, uh, to, to be able to read the scriptures, things that we just take for granted here in the United States. So in, in your local church or even through the school, you can become part of uh, God's missionary program. Well, let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for such men as Zach and his wife. You've laid it upon their heart uh, to be your servant. And Lord, you've directed their steps to the country of Panama. And there are other missionaries out there, Lord, that are still on deputation, some are in country and working very hard. Give them protection. 
Help their ministries to flourish with the word and bringing souls to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless everybody and have a great day. Uh, we'll see you sometime here in the future for our chapel services.